up to this point, we have understood all the different types of graphs and how can you represent the graph data structure using the adjacency list and an adjacency matrix. But just like any other data structure, we must also understand how can you go about traversing this data structure and how do you find elements in this. So in this video, we are going to focus on the depth first search. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. First, I want to go over why traversing a graph is a little bit different. Then we are going to explore the depth first search and how can you do it using a stack. After that, we will write some code to understand both the recursive and the iterative versions of the depth first search. At the end, I just want to take a moment and explore some of the real life applications where you can apply the depth first search. Without further ado, let's get started. Let us say you have this graph in front of you and I ask you that you need to traverse it. So in general, what does traversal mean? Traversal means a certain technique by which you can cover all of the values that are present in your data structure, right? If you remember when you had some linear data structure like arrays and linked lists, traversal was very easy. In an array, you could start from the zeroth index and then traverse all of your elements, right? In a linked list, you usually have a head pointer and then using next values, you can cover your entire list until you reach a null value, right? You are always sure that you have covered all the values. After that, you had nonlinear data structures. For example, a tree. Over there also, you had typically a root node and then a left child and a right child. And what you did is recursively, you could traverse your entire tree. We defined three different traversal techniques, in-order traversal, post-order traversal, and a pre-order traversal. So by all of these methods, you made sure that, hey, I was able to go over all of the values in my data structure at least once, right? So what happens with graphs now? The problem is that let us say, even if I start with node number one, then I do not have a set rule that node one can only have one edge, two edge, or how many edges. So you do not know where to go next. For example, if I am at my first node, then where do I go? Do I go to node two? Do I go to node three? Or do I go to node four? I have so many choices. The problem becomes even more complex. Let us say from node one, I go to node two. Now, where do I go? Do I go to node three and do I go to node five? Let us say I went to node three. Now, where do I go? If I go ahead, I will reach node one again. And what just happened? I had already covered node one, right? So this is the problem. You can bring up an argument that, hey, a graph is represented by an adjacency list like this. So what I can do is I can traverse each of these lists. And by traversing each of the list, I will have covered all of my nodes in the graph. So is that a traversal technique? Well, you can say that yes, you have traversed all of the nodes, but you are wasting a lot of time. For example, if you traverse your first list, you have encountered the nodes one and two. So far, so good. Go to your second list now. You are again encountering node two and node one. Go to your third list now. Once again, you encounter node number two. So you are encountering a single node three times. Think about it. This is such a small graph. What happens if your graph is very huge? What if you have a hundred nodes or a thousand nodes? You will waste so much time if you try to traverse your graph using an adjacency list. That is why there are separate techniques by which you traverse a graph. Depth first search is one of them. So how do you actually go about performing a depth first traversal on a graph? Once again, I have this graph in front of me and we will try to traverse it using the depth first technique. To perform a depth first traversal, you need the help of two additional data structures. You will need a set that is going to store that, okay, I have visited all of these nodes and you will need one more helper stack that will store all of the neighbors. You will gradually understand why we need this stack. To start your traversal, you need a starting point, right? So what we usually do is in our function, we pass in any vertex that we want to start with. Let us say I want to start with my first node, right? So I will pass this node to my function depth first traversal, correct? And when I am passing in this node, basically what I'm doing is I am traversing this node. So I have visited this node. Basically, I will write down one over here. That means I have visited node number one. To move ahead in your depth first traversal, 
the next step you do is you find out what all neighbors does this node have. So currently this node has three neighbors, two, three and four that are its direct connections. So what you do is put all of these nodes in your stack. So I add two, three and then a four. So this is how you visited one node. To proceed ahead, what we do next is just look into the top of your stack and now pop an element. As soon as you pop an element, you got your next node that you have to visit. So right now I got node number four. And how many neighbors does this node have? This node has three neighbors, right? Six, seven, and then one again. So you will add only those nodes to your stack, which you have not visited. So this stack is kind of keeping a record that, okay, I have to travel these nodes in the future, right? So look at node number seven. You have not visited it, right? So add this node to your stack. Next, look at node number six. You haven't visited it. So once again, add this node to your stack. What is the third neighbor? The third neighbor is node one and you have already visited it. So do not add it to your stack. The visit is now complete. You have added node four to your visited nodes and all of its neighbors to your stack, correct? To proceed ahead, follow the same approach once again. Go to your stack and now pop an element. This time we are visiting node number six. So once again, follow the same approach. How many neighbors does this node have? This node has two neighbors, node four and node seven, correct? You have already visited node four. So do not add it to your stack. Have you visited node seven? No. So we are gonna add node number seven once again to our stack. The visit is now complete and to proceed ahead, what we will do is we will once again pop an element from the stack. That means I am now visiting node number seven. Look at its neighbors now. Its neighbors are six and four, right? Six is already visited and four is already visited. So you do not have to do anything more. You are done with your visit of node number seven. Now to proceed ahead with the same condition, what do you do? You once again try to pop an element. If you pop seven, what do you see? You have already visited seven, right? So we will simply ignore this. We do not want to visit it again. Now move ahead. The next node is node number three. That means we are visiting node number three. And how many neighbors does node three have? Node three has two neighbors, one and two, correct? You have already visited node number one. So do not add it to your stack. Have you visited node number two? No. So we will add this element to my stack. And now we are done. Three does not have any more neighbors. Let us keep going ahead. I pop another element. So this time I get node number two. So what are we doing? We are visiting node number two. And how many neighbors does this node have? This node has three neighbors, one, three, and five. You have already visited nodes one and three, right? So you will not add them to your stack, but you haven't visited node five. So what I'm going to do is I will add node number five to my stack. This completes your visit of node number two. Now move ahead, pop the next element. I get a five. That means I am visiting node number five. And how many neighbors does node five have? Node five only has one neighbor that is two and we have already visited it. So we do not put anything in my stack. It is still not over. Go ahead and look in your stack. Try to pop the remaining element. You get a two, but you have already visited two. So what we're going to do is we will simply ignore it. As soon as your stack is completely empty, that is where you stop. And that is when you know that you have covered all of the elements in your graph. So now just watch this graph. I have covered each and every element using the depth first technique. And when I'm doing a depth first technique, this is the traversal that I get. Notice that a depth first traversal isn't fixed. That means that you can get any sort of traversal order based upon the way you are inserting elements in your stack. For example, this time I had inverted two, three and then a four, right? You could have also inserted four first, then a three and then a two. So this would have changed how you're popping elements from the stack and this order of elements would change. But it is always guaranteed that you will cover all the elements. And this is how a depth first traversal actually works. 
Now let us try to write some code for it and this will make things even clear for you. On the left, we have the actual code to implement a depth first search using an iterative method. And on the right, this time I have a smaller graph for better understanding. First of all, we create two data structures that will help us to perform our depth first search. We have a set that will store all of our visited nodes and we have a stack that is gonna store all of the neighbors, right? Notice that I am passing in one parameter that is the start vertex. That means from where do I want to start my depth first traversal? Let us say I'm passing in node number one as my start vertex. So the first thing that we do is we add this vertex to my stack. So as soon as this happens, one gets added to my stack. And now what we're going to do is we are going to keep on running this while loop until our stack is completely empty. So how do we proceed ahead? First of all, we pop an element from the stack and this is going to give us the current vertex that we are working with. So I get my element that I have to work with. And what do I do? I will either print it. That means I am traversing it. And at the same time, I will add this current vertex to my visited set. So this vertex actually gets added to your visited set. The next part is that we add all of the unvisited neighbors to my stack. This vertex has three neighbors, two, three, and four. And you have to add all the unvisited neighbors to your stack. Right now, we haven't visited any of the nodes, correct? So all these nodes, they will get added to my stack over here, right? Basically, what we do is we go over the adjacency list of node number one. Your adjacency list will look something like this, right? So you go over each of the elements in your first list and then only add the elements to your stack, which are not in this visited list, right? Now this loop will run again. And this time, what do we do? We pop another element from the stack. I pop out node number four, right? And as soon as I pop out, what do I do? I will either print it. That means I'm traversing it. And at the same time, I am adding this vertex to my visited node. So this four actually goes in your visited set. And now for the next part, what do we need to do? We need to add all of its unvisited neighbors to my stack. So node four only has one neighbor and that is one. So we check is my neighbor in my visited set. One is already in your visited set, right? So you will not add this neighbor to your stack. This loop ends right over here. And then we are going to run once again. Once again, pop out an element. Three gets popped out. So we either print it or traverse it and then add this three to our visited set. So this is how you will proceed ahead. Once again, you will look at the neighbors of three and only add the elements which you have not visited in your stack. So this loop will continue and you will eventually visit all of the nodes in a depth first manner. The time complexity of this method is order of V plus E where V is the number of vertices and E are the number of edges because you have to traverse each of the node and each of the edges at least once. And the space complexity of this method is order of V because you need at most V amount of space to store all of your nodes in the stack, right? So this was an iterative version. There is a recursive version as well. In the recursive method, once again, we have a method DFS and we pass in a parameter that will tell us that, okay, this is where we want to start. We can start from node one, right? Next, we create a set that will store all of the nodes that we have already visited. This set is going to keep a track that, hey, we have visited these nodes. The next thing that you do is you actually call the DFS recursive method where you pass in the starting vertex and this set that we just created. How does this method look like? If you try to remember, how did we recursively travel a tree? We had a root node and then we did a recursion on the left child and we did a recursion on the right child. Correct. Similarly, while doing a DFS recursively, first of all, we visit the current vertex. So I am visiting vertex number one and I will add this node to my visited set, right? That means I am done with it. The next thing is we need to look at its neighbors. Just like in a tree, we looked at the left child and the right child. So we will use our adjacency list and look at all of the neighbors of the current node. 
its neighbors are 4, 3 and 2, right? So we will perform DFS on each of these nodes. But you only have to perform a DFS if you haven't traversed these nodes already. So you check, are my neighbors in my visited node? If the neighbor is not in the visited node, then you are gonna recursively call the DFS method on this neighbor along with your visited set. So next time, what will happen? Let us say this method gets called with node number four. So four will get added to this list, right? It will backtrack and this time it may get called with node number two. So then two will get added to this set, right? So this is how this will keep on continuing. And when your recursion ends, you will have your complete traversal printed out on your screen, right? The time complexity and the space complexity remain the same, but I always prefer the iterative version because it is easier to understand, visualize and even debug. So this kind of concludes how you can perform a depth first traversal on a graph. I want to just take a moment and visualize that how does a depth first traversal actually looks like. Let us say you have the sample graph in front of you. Don't worry about any of the values. Why do we call it a depth first search? Try to think. Let us say I'm starting from this particular node. Then I will look at all of its neighbors. Let us say I pick up this element from the top of my stack, right? And then what will I do? I will once again look at all of its neighbors. Let us say I pick up this node this time. Once again, I will look at all the neighbors. So what I'm basically doing, I am basically picking a node and then going all the way possible or all the way deep that I can go until I reach a null, right? And then I will go on to my next node and then once again, I will try to go all the way deep as much I, I can go. That is why it is known as a depth first search because you start from a node and try to go as much deep as you can. This is why the name depth first search. You should now be getting a good idea where a depth first search is actually helpful. For example, you might have seen these games, right? How are they solved programmatically? A depth first search will ensure that you start from a point and then try to go as much deep as you can following a certain path. And then you can say that, hey, there exists a solution. If you try to perform any other method, for example, if you try to go here and then try to explore, okay, where can I go? You can go here, you can go here, and then you can go here. Once again, you start from here, you go here and stop, you go here and stop, and then you go here and stop. So if you try to cover your entire maze by exploring each of the path, then it will take a lot of time. And I will give you a hint that is known as a breadth first search. But right now you are doing a depth first search. So you start from a path and then you will try to go as much deep as you can. And that is where a depth first search algorithm is actually helpful. I hope I was able to give you a good idea about the depth first traversal of a graph. As per my final thoughts, I just want to say that take a moment and draw out some graphs on a paper. Don't worry about the code for now and try to perform the depth first traversal on your own. Try to analyze what all patterns you're seeing in the way you are traversing all of these nodes. The depth first technique will be very clear in your mind and you will surely understand why do we call it a depth first search. I would also recommend that, okay, draw out some trees because every tree is a graph, correct? And perform a depth first search on those trees. Just watch what pattern you are seeing when you are traversing all of these nodes. It will be really clear to you. Just try doing this exercise and let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, let me know what problems did you have. I will be glad to discuss all of it with you. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This motivates me to make more and more such videos where I can simplify programming for you. Also, a huge shout out to all the members who support my channel. You guys really keep me going. And as a member, you do get priority reply to your comments. Stay tuned for my next video on the breadth first search. Until then, see ya.